Okay, so in this second section of the Hurston workshop, we're going to be thinking a bit more about Hurston's politics, uh, both kind of her real politics and real life, but also within the novel, and also Hurston's aesthetics. So let me just give you an overview of Hurston's kind of political sense first. Um, so Hurston's finest works of fiction, including The Rise of uh, Watching God, uh, appeared at a time when artistic and political statements, whether single sentences or book-length fictions, were peculiarly conflated. Well, not that peculiar, actually, given the kind of politics of the time. Um, many works of fiction were informed by purely political motives. Political pronouncements frequently appeared in polished literary prose. And Hurston's own political statements relating to racial issues or addressing national politics did not ingratiate her with her black male contemporaries. So we're going to be looking at um, Native Son next week. That might be an example of a, a kind of black literary text that's a little bit more instrumentalized in its politics. So it's a bit more straightforwardly political and kind of left leaning. So the result of this was that Their Eyes Were Watching God went out of print not long after it first appeared, and it remained out of print for nearly 30 years. Um, Henry Louis Gates Jr. has been one of many um, to ask, how could the recipient of two Guggenheims and the author of four novels, a dozen short stories, two musicals, two books on black mythology, dozens of essays and a prize winning autobiography virtually disappear from her readership for three full decades? Um, so Hurston went out of print and she was kind of rediscovered in the 1970s by the black feminist writer Alice Walker um, and then she's been kind of re-celebrated since then and kind of um, put back into the black American canon. But to uh, look a bit in a bit more detail at Hurston's politics then, So, um, Hurston can be seen as a kind of conservative figure, or here as I've positioned her as a kind of almost radical conservative figure. So, for example, she has said, if I say a whole system must be upset for me to win, I'm saying I cannot sit in the game and that safer rules must be made to give me a chance. I repudiate that. If others are in there, deal me a hand and let me see what I can make of it even though I know some in there are dealing from the bottom and cheating like hell in other ways. So this is kind of an interesting um, take on um, capitalism, uh, the gamification of capitalism. Hurston is absolutely recognizing that um, there's a game to be played and she's kind of asking to be dealt a hand within that game um, and not asking, which is uh, what a lot of black intellectuals and left-wing thinkers at the time were asking for, which was a radical revolutionary change in um, the kind of social sphere um, to enable black people to, to achieve equality. Um, another one of her very celebrated essays, How It Feels to Be Coloured Me, which I would uh, recommend. It's also available for you to read on Moodle. Uh, Hurston says, I am not tragically coloured. There is no great sorrow dammed up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood, who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal, and whose feelings are all hurt about it. That thing about feelings being hurt is very kind of snowflake, isn't it? Even in the House of Scouts skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife. So you can see here again, there's a real sense of individualism that we get from Hurston here. So I've seen that the world is to the strong. So therefore, if you're a strong individual, you're going to survive and thrive. And if you're not, then, then you're not going to. Um, but there's no sense in, in Hurston here of the kind of structural factors at play um, in inequality. Um, she's in many ways holding to the quite kind of traditional liberal American view of individualism that was put forward by figures like Emerson in the, in the 19th century. Um, but, it, but interestingly, if you look at Hurston's life, um, so she, she kind of fell out of print 
um, and then she she unfortunately led quite a kind of tragic life in the, in the last remaining decades because she hadn't achieved any fame she became quite impoverished so it'd be interesting to look at whether her politics changed at all because despite her being a kind of genius of literary fiction and um, she wasn't given the acclamation that she deserved while she was alive Okay, so I'm going to move on now and talk about um, the gaze within the novel. Um, and this thinking comes from um, an MA student who I had last year called Veronica Nero, who has written on the novel. So I'm just going to start by reading out her kind of basic argument around how the gaze functions um, within the novel. So she says, the novel can be better subversive as it displays instances of what Hooks defines as oppositional gaze. Using Hook's identification of the gaze as a possibility of agency for black women, we can explore the ways in which the characters engage in resistance by simply looking back and rejecting their relegation to passive objects of male desire or the white imperial gaze. And I'm just gonna go through now and kind of um, describe what we mean by oppositional gaze, by male gaze, which you may have heard of, and also um, white imperial gaze. So let's start with the white gaze. So I'll just talk through this first and then we can read out the quote. So on the one hand, we can recognize a race related oppression, what we can define as the white gaze. As theorized by Franz Fanon, being gazed at and hence objectified by the white other black people lose the possibility of agency. So Fanon says, um, the black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man. His customs and the sources on which they were based were wiped out because they were in conflict with a civilization that he didn't know and that imposed himself on him. So while black people turn, quote, beseechingly to others and are forced to crave their attention as a way to achieve self-recognition, they are in fact diminished and reduced to stereotypes and caricatures, which lead to an annihilation and cultural erasure. Black, blackness is subsequently deprived of any ontological meaning, as it can only be asserted in relation to whiteness. So this is another quote from Fanon. Not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. So this is kind of slightly challenging, I suppose, Hurston's own um, representation in the novel where we do have a kind of autonomous black community. But what Fanon here is talking about is the ontological, so the erasure of the self of blackness through these years of oppression. So this is something we can think through and, and, and work through in the, in the seminar. But this is Fanon, who's a very important uh, black thinker of the 20th century. Um, his text, Black Skin, White Masks, which I would highly recommend. It was first published in 1952. Um, as a way of understanding what it means to be gazed at by, um, by the white class. And what it means to feel that you are uh, being gazed upon as a black, quote, other. So black women, however, had to face a double oppression. In addition to the white gaze, they were subject to what Laura Mulvey calls the male gaze. Um, while her essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema was written in 1973. So the, the male gaze was, was uh, conceptualized after the white gaze. That's important, Fanon, uh, Fanon is first. Um, Laura Mulvey in The Male Gaze um, refers to 20th century cinema, but we can argue that the same concerns can be applied to the representation of female blackness, in particular by male writers, in, the, in early 20th century literature. So we're now gonna look at Laura Mulvey. And this is kind of her main principal argument within the text. So she says, in a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female form, which is styled accordingly. In their traditional exhibitionist role, women are simultaneously looked at and displayed, 
with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact so that they can be said to connote a to-be-looked-at-ness. Um, so this idea of sexual imbalance, of being an active male gazer and a passive female kind of recipient of the male gaze means that women are both looked at but also deny any sense of agency to be able to kind of look back. Um, and if we think again about black women and how they've been understood in the 20th century, black women were often sexualized uh, for male pleasure, but also, and also doubly objectified through that kind of desiring. Um, so we've got two, two forms of negation here. We've got the white, white gaze, which negates a sense of kind of, um, racial agency and we've got the male gaze which kind of negates a sense of um, gendered or female agency so what can be done about this okay so now we move on to bell hooks who is another really important black feminist writer of the late 20th century i love all of her books she's phenomenal do look her up um, so as a response to both these op oppressive forms of gaze so the male gaze and the white gaze, Bell Hooks theorizes what she calls the oppositional gaze, drawing upon Michael Foucault and his assertion that every form of oppression gives the possibility for resistance. She postulates that the gaze can be reclaimed by black women simply by looking back. The, the gaze can thus become a powerful means of subversion against the repression of black people's right to look. While historically enslaved black people were punished for looking, the gaze can be reappropriated with the purpose of undermining the power relationships which presents white supremacy as the only option. So this is from Bell Hooks, Black Looks, Race and Representation from 1992, where she says, spaces of agency exist for black people wherein we can both interrogate the gaze of the other, but also look back and at one another, naming what we see. So instead of a kind of um, singular gaze, which is operating in one direction, so if you think about the male gaze or the white gaze, it operates in one direction, um, a white man looking at a black woman, for example. Here we've got the gaze operating kind of in a multi-directional way. So um, the gaze of the other can look back, can look at one another and can also name what we see, naming what we see, which seems to me a really essential part of this because if you go back to the Bible and the idea that Adam um, named uh, nature within the Garden of Eden, he named all the plants and animals. Here we have a reclaiming of that sense of naming. Um, so I'll continue. The gaze has been and is a site of resistance for colonized black people globally. Subordinates in, relation, in relations of power learn experientially that there is a critical gaze, one that looks to document, one that is oppositional. In resistance struggle, the power of the dominated to assert agency by claiming and cultivating awareness politicizes looking relations. One learns to look a certain way in order to resist. So this is the theory. This is the theory of the oppositional gaze and how that can function in kind of real life politics. Um, but we could also think about how this functions in the novel. As we know, the title is Their Eyes Were Watching God, which is a slightly less um, active form of, of looking if you're watching God and waiting for God. So what I'm going to do next is ask you to um, look at a section of the novel for close reading and think about how the gaze is, is kind of functioning in this um, particular section. And I'm actually gonna play um, a recording from the audio book. The audio book of Their Eyes Are Watching God is fantastic. I'd really recommend it, particularly for the dial um, dialogue and the dialect. So, the section is, I believe, from chapter two. It's very early on in the novel. 
and I'm going to play this and play the audio recording and hopefully the sound quality will be okay. She thought a while and decided that her conscious life had commenced at Nanny's gate. On a late afternoon, Nanny had called her to come inside the house because she had spied Janie letting Johnny Taylor kiss her over the gatepost. It was a spring afternoon in West Florida. Janie had spent most of the day under a blossoming pear tree in the backyard. She had been spending every minute that she could steal from her chores under that tree for the last three days. That was to say, ever since the first tiny bloom had opened, it had called her to come and gaze on a mystery. From barren brown stems to glistening leaf buds, from the leaf buds to snowy virginity of bloom, it stuck. It was like a flute song forgotten in another existence and remembered again. What? Singing, she heard that had nothing to do with her ears. The rose of the world was breathing out smell. It followed her through all her waking moments and caressed her in her sleep. It connected itself with other vaguely felt matters that had struck her outside observation and buried themselves in her flesh. Now they emerged and quested about her consciousness. She was stretched on her back beneath the pear tree, soaking in the alto chant of the visiting bees, the gold of the sun and the panting breath of the breeze, when the inaudible voice of it all came to her. She saw a dust-bearing bee sink into the sanctum of a bloom. The thousand sister calyxes arched to meet the love embrace and the ecstatic shiver of the tree from root to tiniest branch, creaming in every blossom and frothing with delight. So this was a marriage. She had been summoned to behold a revelation. Then Janie felt a pain remorseless, sweet, that left her limp and languid. Okay, so this is the section I would like you to close read before the seminar. You don't have to pick all of it, you can just pick out certain phrases, certain terms, certain words that interest you. So, Close with this section, paying particular attention to imagery, voice, and articulation. So imagery, the images that are, that are used, voice. So this is Janie narrating her own story. So we can think about Janie's voice here. But also the articulation of those ideas. I think the phrasing of those, some of those ideas is really interesting. And a couple of questions for you also to think about, which are a little bit broader. So the first one is, how are eyes and the gaze used in the text? And you might be able to think of some other examples where eyes and the gaze and looking are kind of mentioned. And what does the title, their eyes were watching God, refer to? Um, and, and how can we understand that title in relation to the text? It's a, it's a somewhat kind of... Um, distinct title from, from a lot of what goes on. So how can we kind of relate the bulk of the narrative to, to that title? Okay, and that is all for now. I look forward to seeing you in seminars later on.